Good morning, church family. Hope you're doing well today. We are so thankful that you're here. And hey, this is just one of two things happening this week here at Southern Lake. Something happened on Friday night. I don't know. Christmas Eve, right? Coming up so fast. So fast. Christmas Eve, we have two services this Friday night, uh, 2 and 3.30. We'd love you to join us for one or both. Or if you're, you're online, you can uh, watch the second service. We'll be streaming the second service on that night. So please join us. Hey, we have another incredible opportunity coming up in the new year. Our New Year's Eve Game of Palooza. Wow. Friday, December 31st, of course, New Year's Eve, right? Uh, we are going to be here. It's kind of an open house with games and fun and food for the whole family. You can come and uh, stay for as long as you'd like, leave at any time, but there's going to be an opportunity to be here and, and bring in the new year with a lot of fun and being with your church family. So come on out for that. Mark your calendars. Be here. Pastor Ken. Well, good morning, everyone. You look exhausted. How many of you went out, like, shopping or doing something yesterday? Oh, seriously? I thought everybody in the world was out driving or something yesterday. I was on my way back from Cincinnati, and it was busy, busy times for sure all the way out there. So maybe you guys just stay home and napped. I don't know what you did. That would be a good thing, I'm sure. Welcome to Southern Lakes Church. If you're a guest today, I want to say a special welcome to you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule 
to spend a little bit of that with us. You could help us to get connected with you if you'd like. No pressure there, but there's some communication cards in the chair racks in front of you. You could fill those out and uh, drop it in the giving boxes on your way out today. Consider that your contribution with us. Or better yet, you can take it to the Welcome Center and uh, drop it off there. We have a gift that we'd love to put into your hands, answer any questions you might have about Southern Lakes Church. So thank you for being here uh, with us today. Today we want to celebrate, uh, if you look up in the front here, uh, some amazing work that's been done by our quilters here at the church. There's a, a quilting, do you call it a guild? I'm not even sure if you call it that. Uh, there's a quilting group that gets together and they don't just, you know, share the juicy gossip or whatever is going on there, but they spend some time doing some great work. And I'm just going to step off the stage for a moment because uh, what I want you to invite you to do is come and look at these quilts, uh, the handiwork that they have done. Uh, they've made these quilts, and they're going to be given out to different families in Walworth County through the Safe Families. And uh, one of the things I want to point out is if you just look... I love this. They, they put a little tag on these that say, Made for you with love by the quilters of Southern Lakes Church. Love God, love people, make disciples. And uh, just a beautiful uh, reminder that these were done with a heart of love. And uh, they are uh, purposely smaller because they're supposed to be like comfort quilts. So you can just kind of snuggle up when you're watching the Packers beat the Ravens or whoever's the latest, you know, person they're playing. And, um, and hopefully they'll remember, you know, God's love and feel God's love in that moment. So great idea. Uh, Margaret Hetzel, she's here. Raise your hand, Margaret. If you want to know anything more about this and you'd like to get involved, uh, talk to Margaret right there. Uh, she's got the Green Bay stuff on right in the middle. Um, so praise God for all of this. Our intent, again, is it's a, a tangible way to show love to our community. I'm just so impressed with the, the various ways our church family is finding to, to put a touch of love on our community in various ways. And, and I'm just so impressed and thankful for that. And I just want to give that all to God. Would you pray with me as we dedicate these quilts to his purpose? God, thank you for the love that has gone into uh, each and every one of these, uh, the time, the talent. And we trust that you will use it in a great way. That as the recipients feel that and they realize somebody spent time, their time, and their money to give that to them, that, that it'll make an impression on them in their life and their everlasting soul. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have to show love to our community. And I pray that we continue to do this in new and creative ways so that everyone might hear of the good news of Jesus. We give this all back to you in praise now. In Jesus' name, amen. I didn't say anything about giving, but continue to give uh, year-end gifts as you're able uh, online or in person. And uh, we believe God's going to continue to use that in marvelous ways. You can remain seat seated as we hear our Advent reading this morning. Good morning, church family. We are Bill and Sandy Rimey, and today we're going to be lighting the love candle. The fourth week of Advent we light the love candle. It reminds us of what God teaches us in the book of 1 John. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. This Christmas season, may we love others well, that the world might see Jesus Christ 
in and through us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have ever, everlasting life. Let us continue to rejoice and sing to God, remembering the love that he gave when he sent us his one and only Son, Jesus. Will you stand and join us as we continue to sing?
an all holy night. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Jesus. We celebrate you. That's why we're here. That's why we have Christmas as so much a part of uh, church life. And, uh, and just every year, come to this place, we remember your birth. We remember what you did when you came into this world, not only to be born to us, God with us, but to, to ultimately grow up and give your life on the cross for us. And we thank you. We praise you. We lift your name high today. Uh, and I, I know my prayer and my prayer for all of us here is to, to remember the ultimate cost and the life that you've given us through yourself and that we wouldn't forget that and we would celebrate it well this Christmas season. It's in your name, Jesus, we do pray. Amen. You may have a seat.
Let me invite you to take your Bibles with me this morning and uh, turn to John's Gospel, uh, John chapter 1, where we've been uh, looking at the glorious arrival of Jesus Christ, uh, uh, taking kind of a break from Matthew and uh, Luke's account and looking at what John has to say about the word uh, becoming flesh, this glorious arrival. And uh, uh, what better way to start talking about this glorious arrival than to share with you uh, another glorious arrival. Asher Justice Anderson has come into this world uh, Tuesday. Uh, he's been a long-awaited, right? Uh, it's like in the fullness of time. And uh, he finally came. And uh, I know you always want to know details. So he was 19 and a half inches long, weighed nine pounds, two ounces. And uh, Great little guy, uh, a lot of fun there. Uh, he's already teaching Grandpa a couple things, like how to pray. What a, what a picture right there. Um, he's praying for the other team, not the Packers, by the way, right there. You know, uh, I'm just kidding. Whoa, man. Almost thought we had Viking fans in the audience for a moment today, but they're playing Baltimore. Come on. So uh, great, great uh, opportunity. We went down there, and uh, Dawn's still there, spending a couple days with them, but I got to go down and visit Asher and, and come on back, and uh, exciting times for sure. Well, as we talk about the glorious arrival, we've been encouraging you to pause, to ponder, and to praise. And so I hope you've been doing that, uh, because if we're going to really... Uh, capture and focus on the true meaning of Christmas, that's what we need to do. Uh, we need to celebrate in all of its fullness the Word made flesh who came and dwelt among us. And we've been exploring that. And John, of course, has helped us to do that. John uh, chapter 1. The last couple of weeks we've been looking at the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the fact that this Word became flesh, God sent His Son to this earth, and He dwelt among us. So follow along as I read uh, the first uh, several verses, and then we're going to skip down a little bit. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Uh, jump down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And so what we see here in verse number 18 and where we want to uh, focus our attention today is that Jesus is the revelation of God. He declares the Father to us. And part of the reason of Jesus coming is so that we could know God much better and we can have a relationship with him. Uh, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 3, that God, who at various times and various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, in the Old Testament he spoke through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. And so in our day he has spoken to us through his Son. The living word, if you would, has come to be with us. And as we talked about last week, uh, the fact is that God didn't just create mankind and then just kind of disappear and become a detached. He's involved. He created us because he wants to have fellowship with us. He wants to be in relationship with us. And so he has revealed himself to us so that we can know him, so that we can enter in, so that we can have that relationship with us, with him. And know that he loves us, that he cares for us, that he has provided for us, all these things. But if God didn't do that, if God didn't reveal himself to us, we wouldn't know him, right? He has chosen to do that. 
through his son. Like, for instance, how many of you know my first name? Okay, a lot of you know my first name, uh, Pastor Ken, right? I don't know which is the first and the last, Pastor Ken. <laughs> you know, that gets mixed up, right? But my first name's Ken, Kenneth. Don't call me Kenny. Uh, how many of you know my last name? Okay, a lot of you know my last name. Do you know how to spell it? Brummel? Okay, that's my last name. So you know my first name, my last name. Do you know my middle name? How many of you know my middle name? Nobody knows my middle name. Interesting. How many of you know my nickname? You, no, you're not going to find out any nicknames today, that's for sure. Okay. Some other day, maybe. Okay. So you want to know my, my middle name? Come back next week and I'll read. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Arthur. My middle name is Arthur. Kenneth Arthur Brummel. Very strong name. It's great. Uh, I don't mind it. You can call me Arthur. That's okay because uh, it doesn't bother me. It's a great name. Well, now you know something about me you didn't know before you came in this morning. But you wouldn't know that about me unless I revealed it to you. Well, in the same way, there are things we wouldn't know about God. We wouldn't know anything about God unless he revealed that to us. And so that's what God has done. In these last days, he's revealed himself to us. And I'm so thankful that he's done that. And he's done that in a number of ways, by the way. I'm just going to hit on some big ones here this morning. The first way that he has revealed himself to us is through creation. Uh, we call that the general revelation of God. Uh, the Bible tells us that God has given us creation so that we can know him, right? Go on to the next slide, please. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Uh, you, you can't look into the night sky and, and, and think anything other than God is amazing. God is glorious. Romans chapter 1 uh, tells us, for, the, since, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Think about that. Being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. You see, you and I are without excuse because God has revealed himself to us. We know that there's a creator God. This just didn't happen. There's too much order. There's too much power. There's too much creativity. It's all come into being because God has shown himself to us. Uh, for instance, if you look at a sunset, right? Why is it that we even have the capacity to appreciate that sunset. Oh, why do we think it's beautiful? And why is every sunset completely different? Because creator God. Uh, we can look at the universe and we can just see, you know, the more uh, powerful man's uh, telescopes become, the more, you know, we, we learn about the universe, the deeper, the vaster we, we find out it is. It's infinite because the creator God is infinite and he created all of that, but it testifies of God. It, it shows us about God. Uh, the flowers, beautiful flowers, all the different flowers. Evolution doesn't explain that. All the beauty, all the creativity, the amazing. God did all of that and gave us the ability to appreciate it all. A, a new baby, my grandson there, I just looked at him and held him and marveled this week. You know, 10 fingers and 10 toes, and you just think about how that baby was was conceived and grew up in, uh, in the womb and how God formed him in that way. By the way, I do have a correction uh, I need to throw out there from last week. Somebody pointed out to me last week that when I was talking about how Jesus recre recreated the life cycle from conception all the way through, I, I misspoke and I said I was pro-choice. And some people pointed that out to me. I meant to say I was pro-life. Sometimes my mouth gets ahead of my brain. I know none of you have that problem. But when you're preaching, that happens a lot of times. You're just saying something, and you're thinking about the next thing you're going to say, and something else comes out the way you never meant it. But correction there. I am pro-life. Uh, I believe in uh, life all the way through because that's the way God did it. And, and you can't look at a baby. You can't look at the creation of God without appreciating the creator. So that's God's revelation of himself to us, and we're without excuse. It starts there. But then he takes that general revelation, and he gives us what's called specific revelation, and that's the word of God. The word of God. 
I mean, think about how much we know God just because of this book that he has given us. We know him so much better what he is like uh, because he has given us his word. Uh, 2 Timothy uh, 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The inspiration that he's talking about there is not small I inspiration. Oh, you know, this is very inspiring. It's capital I inspiration because in the Greek, the word there is theopneustos, and it literally means God breathed. When God gave us his word, he literally breathed it. He breathed it through human beings and their personality and and, and their abilities and their circumstances. But he breathed into them his word, inspired it so that you and I can have it for the purpose of what? Of knowing him. By the way, what a wonderful privilege that every day you and I can open this blessed book and get to know our father and fellowship with him. I just love God's word, and I hope you do too. And and the more you read it, the more you study it, the more you ponder uh, on it, the more you you allow it to come into your life, the memorization, the meditation on God's word, the more you're going to appreciate who God is. And and I'll just tell you this. I've been studying this book for a long time, preaching it for a long time now, and uh, I am more convinced than ever that man could not have written the Bible. This is not a work of man. This is God's inspired word. The wisdom that is here, uh, the revelation of God that is here, it's a gift to us. But the interesting thing was, God didn't just give us his creation, general revelation, and the specific revelation of his word. But now we come to John chapter 1, and what does he say? He says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And in these last days... He's revealed himself to us in a greater way through the person of Jesus Christ. So another way that we know the revelation of God is through the Son. And as I've already pointed out in Hebrews chapter 1, in these last days, he's spoken to us through his Son. Think about all that we know about God because of how we know Jesus and the life of Jesus. And that's why if you want to get to know God, again, you go into his word and you get to know Jesus And as you see Jesus, he reveals, he declares the Father to us. That's how we know the Father heart of God through his son, Jesus Christ. He declared him to us. That word declared, if you look at it in the Greek, uh, go on to the next slide right there, uh, is exegesato. It means to explain, to unfold, to lead the way. We get the English word exegesis from this. Uh, That word means to... uh, to interpret or reveal what's there. And so when you exegete the word of God, you're, you're simply bringing out what's already there. Ex means out. So exegesis is speaking out of the word of God as, as it's revealed. Uh, eisegesis, which is wrong, is reading our interpretations into the word of God. And so we're exegeting the word, word of God every time we preach the word of God, hopefully. And that's what Jesus did for us. He is that living word that exegetes the word of God to us, that exegetes God to us. Jesus declared the Father to us, and on purpose, so that we can know him, so we can love him, so we can have a relationship with him. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, this baby coming to uh, be born and in a manger, we think about the whole Christmas story, there was a purpose behind all of this, that he would come and he would declare the Father to us, We can't see God, but yes, we can. Through Jesus, who was God, the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Now, there's a lot of different directions we could go with this as we talk about how Jesus declared the Father to us. But I was drawn to John's gospel again. And uh, he has so much to say, and we don't have time to get to everything that uh, John has to say. I hope you'll read it for yourself. But but what I want to do is highlight just five of the I am statements that are found in the Gospel of John. There's more than just five. But Jesus said in John 8, 58, he he said, uh, I am. I'm the great I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And the people knew exactly what he was saying at that point because he was declaring himself to be God, the God of the Old Testament. Uh, When Moses said, who should I say sent me? God told him, I am has sent you. 
I am who I am. I am the great I am. And so the people of the Old Testament at this time, in Jesus' time, they knew God as the great I am. And so for Jesus to say I am was saying that he was God. And if you look at the very next verse, John 8, 59, the people took up stones to kill him, to stone him to death. Why? Because that was blasphemy. To say that he was the I am, that he was God. But time and again, that's what Jesus did. He came back and he said, I am. And here's just five of them. And as we, we look at how Jesus declared himself to the world, he declared God. He showed us God and some things about God and so many things to contemplate there today. Uh, the first one is found in uh, John chapter 8. Pardon me, John chapter 6. I am the bread of life. Uh, this is the story of the feeding of the 5,000, <clears> where Jesus again took uh, five loaves, barley loaves, and two small fish, and he multiplied them, miraculously multiplied them, and fed 5,000 plus people. And then they took up all the, the fragments, and there was 12 baskets full. You always got to have leftovers, you know? And so they had all the good leftovers. I don't know if it was one basket for each one of the disciples or what, but they had all these leftovers, and it just showed some amazing things about God, right? John uh, 6, 34 and 35, Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And there's some things that we learn about God in this story, in this episode in Jesus' life, right? That God can do anything. Jesus declares that, reveals that to us. Uh, God is over creation. He can multiply the fish. He can multiply the loaves. It's no problem for God. Uh, it, it demonstrates that God cares for our every need. Uh, these people were hungry. <laughs> they had no place to go. And so uh, he had them all sit down, orderly fashion, and, and prayed, and and fed them. God cares about our physical needs. But then he also provides for our ultimate sustenance. And that's what this is ultimately about, right? It wasn't just about our physical food. It was about our spiritual food and nourishment and the fact that he is the bread of life. And he who partakes of him has true life. He is the bread of life. Now, one of the things I revealed to you last Christmas was one of my favorite Christmas cookies. You remember what that was? Monster cookies. Oh, yeah. They're great. How many love monster cookies? I mean, they're very healthy. I mean, you got to have great Christmas cookies this time of year. What's your favorite Christmas cookie? You can tell me afterwards. Uh, but, by the way, they're calorie-free over the next two weeks, so it's all good. You can have as many of them as you want. It's not a problem. But, but I love the monster cookies. They're healthy for you. They got oatmeal in them. They're, you know, M&Ms. It's all good. It's all good. Chocolate, right? It's all very healthy. God sees to our needs. Our physical needs, uh, special things that we like to eat, gives us the ability to taste and enjoy. But he's the bread of life. And ultimately sees to a greater need not just our physical needs, but our spiritual needs. And ultimately, he is the bread of life. Ultimately, our sustenance for all eternity. That's what it's about. The, the second great I am statement here is found in John chapter 8, uh, verse number 12. I am the light of the world. And this is the story of the woman that was taken in adultery. And if, uh, if you remember that... Um, uh, they were trying to set Jesus up, and so they brought a woman that was actually in the act of adultery, and they brought her to him and said, you know, what do you say? Uh, should we stone her? Should we kill her? And if you recall the story, Jesus stooped down and started writing uh, in the dirt, and we don't know what he wrote. We don't understand what was all happening there, but the people started leaving, all, all the accusers, to the point where Jesus said, you know, where are your accusers? And there were none there. And he said, uh, I don't accuse you either. He said, go and sin no more. And so we, we learn some things again about God in this situation, that he is light. And, and then that's what he said just coming out of that. He said, go and sin no more. And then the next thing he says, John eight twelve is he spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. What a beautiful picture that is painted for us there. 
And so there's some things that we learn about God that are declared to us in all of that. God is light, 1 John 1, 5. God is light and in, in him is no darkness at all. We see that God hates sin. He didn't give this woman a pass and say, it's okay that you sin. No, he said, go and sin no more. But then we see that God loves the sinner. He says, neither do I condemn you. And, and so we see the compassion, the heart of God, the forgiveness that God gives in a situation like that. And by the way, we all need that, right? Anybody here need second chances? We all do, right? And so he's a God of second chances, and we see that mercy and forgiveness. He doesn't condemn us. He loves us. Uh, there's another story that, that is very similar to this in the very next chapter uh, where Jesus, again, is declared as the light of the world. John chapter 9, the man who was born blind, and uh, Jesus heals him. Can you imagine his whole life was just darkness? He never saw the light of day. He never saw anything. And Jesus opens his eyes, and now the light comes in. That's the light of the world. And, and I love that blind man's testimony when the Pharisees put him on the stand, so to speak, and said, you know, who is this? What happened? And so forth. What is his testimony? John 9, 25, he says, one thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. I love that. And that should be all of our stories as well. I don't understand, but the light of the world came into my life once I was blind, but now I see. And we have the opportunity to share that light with others. And let me just encourage you, uh, over the next week, uh, we have these uh, around, if you didn't pick up some of these already, uh, they're meant to go to your friends and neighbors. So think about who you would like to invite to Christmas services here on Christmas Eve and the 26th and any time. Just invite them. I've got some sitting on my table that, I, that are awaiting me, taking them to my neighbors this week and looking forward to inviting them. And, and we have that opportunity, right, to share the light of the world. Once I was blind, but now I can see. You can see. And we have to share that good news with others. He is the light. Number three, John 10, I am the good shepherd. Jesus declared or revealed for us that, that God cares. He declared himself as a shepherd. Uh, you see the father heart of God. Go on to the next slide, please. The father heart of God comes through in this good shepherd analogy there. He cares for his sheep. He provides. He protects. He loves. Just like a good shepherd would the sheep. God pursues us when we stray. What does a shepherd do? Oh, pfft, one sheep, no big deal. Let the wolves have it. No. He'll leave the 99 and go after the one. That's what God does for us. Aren't you glad he pursues us? The Bible said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so we see the sacrifice as well. Jesus said the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And that's exactly what God has done for you and I. He has given his life. He came to this world to give his life. What an amazing God we have. And Jesus reveals all of this to us. Uh, John chapter 11 is another one. Uh, I am the resurrection and the life. And this is the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. And if you recall, uh, they sent to Jesus because he was sick and they wanted him to come and heal him, but Jesus tarried and he didn't go immediately, but then he did go after a while. And Lazarus had been dead four days. And still Jesus said, Come forth, Lazarus. And he came forth bound, head to toe, but he was alive. God raised him from the dead. And so we learn a number of things about God in that story right there. God loves us. John eleven five. 5, it says specifically that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And he loves us. We see that over and over again. He has compassion on us. He had compassion on them. Uh, eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. And we see that compassion and the love that he has. And then we see in verse 25 that he has power over the grave. And I don't know about you, but that gives us hope. That gives us joy. That helps us to know that, that he can do anything, right? He raised Lazarus uh, a while later. He rose from the dead after three days. And he can raise you and I. This life isn't all there is. We learn that about God. God gives that all to us. So what is God like? Well, he's personal, he's loving, he's compassionate, he's powerful, right? Which leads to the last thing in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Again, he's revealing God to us. He's the way, the truth, and the life. This was uh, spoken at the Last Supper. 
And we're going to have communion today together in a little bit. But, but, but he was painting a picture of who he was, even for his disciples at that point. And he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again. So I'm going to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And Thomas said, how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And so Jesus declares the Father to us in that way. We see that God loves us and wants, to, wants us to be with him for all eternity. He didn't create us to just be here for a short time and that's it. We get to be with him forever. God has provided for salvation. That little babe in the manger is salvation. It's the good news. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. Jesus came to die, to die in your place, to die in my place. It's interesting today we uh, have the Advent calend- uh, uh, the ad- Advent candle of love. And as you think about God, he has revealed himself to us as a God of love. God is love, First John says. And we see the Father heart of God, we see the love, and the way that love was demonstrated to us was in the cross, ultimately. That Jesus paid the price for your sin and my sin so that we could be forgiven and we could go free. That's the good news of Christmas. That's what the rejoicing is. That's why it's a glorious arrival. Because God saw our greatest need and he provided for it in his son, Jesus Christ. So my friends, you can be forgiven today. If you're watching online, you're saying, what is the answer? The answer is Jesus. You need to come to him and by faith, trust him as your savior to forgive your sins. And then you can enter into a relationship with him. You see, God saw that there was a barrier between us and him. Uh, Sin gets in the way. But Jesus breaks that barrier down by forgiving the sin. That's why he died on the cross, so that, that sin could be erased, that sin debt could be erased. And now we can have a free and open relationship with God. That's what it's about. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so Jesus reveals all this to us so that we can know him. Do you know him? If you don't, today would be a great day. Just open your heart and invite Jesus in to be your Savior. Let's summarize in verse number 18. What does he say again? He says that no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Jesus has revealed, declared God to us because he is God. He is the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. And so what we've been encouraging you to do in this season is to pause, ponder, and praise. Uh, Several weeks back as I was uh, planning and praying about this series, I was out for a prayer walk and just enjoying God's great creation. And I remember asking God, just saying, you know, these are some pretty deep theological concepts. The word becoming flesh and dwelling among us and, 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 you know, the word is God and he created all things. And I'm like, God, how can we make this practical? And so we can really kind of enter in and understand that more completely. And one of the things that God gave me at that time was this pause, ponder, and praise. And I just wanted to pass that on to you. And and the first week, that's what I did. And I thought it was just going to be done. I was just going to give you that as a little homework assignment uh, for that week. But then it kind of caught some steam. And people were talking about it all week. And what a blessing it was. And and so we've continued that. And so I want to continue it with you. Because I think it will really help us to focus in on the true meaning of Christmas. Pause in this busyness. Pause this next week. you got the countdown of six days coming here. Just pause. Uh, Hit the pause button as a family. I know it can be so chaotic. And then ponder. Ponder the truths we've talked about today. Open the scripture. Reread some of these stories. Go back to this passage of scripture, meditate on it, ponder it. Ponder it in your heart. What does it mean? What does it mean for you? What has God done for you? How has he shown his love to you? See God's faithfulness. And in all of that then, (laughs) what's going to happen? You're going to erupt in praise. How can you not? 
That's what God wants us to do. So let me invite you to continue to do that, to pause, ponder, and praise him this week of Christmas. As you think about Christmas, what's the focus? What's your focus, right? If we're going to enjoy Christmas in its totality, its fullness, we have to understand that Jesus is the word. He is eternal. He is God. He is our creator. He has revealed himself to us as life and light. He came in the flesh and he dwelt among us and he's declared the Father to us. Praise him for that. Think about that. That's Christmas. Let's pray. Father, we give you the glory today. We thank you for bringing your son, Jesus Christ, into this world. What a gift. What a blessing. He has declared the Father to us. He has declared what you're like to us. We can know your heart, your love, your forgiveness, your compassion, your provision, and so much more. We can know your salvation. And so, Father, we praise you for that today. We give you the glory. And I pray if there's anyone that does not know you, that they would open their heart today to you. And for those who do know you, that they would continue to open their heart to you, that they would pause and ponder and praise, that would live out, they would share your love, be that conduit of light and life to others. Declare your goodness. We do that today. I do that today, God. I declare your goodness. You are God. We thank you in Jesus' name. We're going to transition to communion at this time, and what a, a wonderful way to just kind of capture a message like that and think about how even in communion, Jesus continues to declare the Father heart of God to us. Every time we partake of the elements, the broken body, the shed blood of Jesus, they symbolize what God has done for us. Uh, I'm just going to stick with John. We haven't read everything out of John chapter 1, but one of the things that happens in this chapter as well is John the Baptist declares Jesus and reveals him to the world. And he said this in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He said, Look, there's Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah. He came to take away our sins. He's that perfect lamb of God. People knew what that was. They knew what it was to, to sacrifice a lamb for their sin. That sin, that, that the blood of that, that sin offering that would, would cover their sin. But Jesus was the perfect lamb of God that took away the sin of the world once and for all for your sin and my sin. And so let me encourage you today as we come to the table and we have communion together to pause, to ponder, and to praise. We have this opportunity right now this morning to pause. Think about what he's done for you. Think about what that broken body and that shed blood is all about. I'm going to be quiet for a few moments and allow you to do that in this moment. Would you look to God? Please continue to pause, ponder, and praise as uh, we serve ourselves the elements. Let me explain how this works. Uh, there's four stations around the room if you haven't been with us before. and uh, Go to the one that's nearest you. Just please start in the main aisles and then go back on the side aisles. It helps it to work for everybody. And it's a double cup, so take the bread and the juice. And then take it back to your seats. And once everybody is served, we'll partake of the elements together. If you're watching online, you can just grab something from home, uh, some crackers and some juice, and maybe hit the pause button for a moment and come back um, and watch us and partake of the elements with us from there as well. And, and so once everybody's been served, uh, we will uh, 
uh, partake of the elements together. Let me encourage you at this time to come and uh, serve yourselves and go back and uh, we'll partake in a moment. The Bible tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us remember it together. And in the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink together. Father, we rejoice. <clears throat> in what you've done for us. Thank you for coming to this earth, revealing yourself to us, paying that awful penalty for our sins so that we can enter in and know you, to love you and serve you. We rejoice in you today. We rejoice in your coming. We give you thanks from the bottom of our hearts. Help us now, Father, to share your love with others, to be that conduit, to bring the light and life to this world. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will you stand and celebrate and rejoice and sing with us?
you guys have a wonderful, blessed week, and we'll see you Christmas Eve. God bless.